obviously is the Peninsula of Seal, as you probably know. There and there have a very, very simple transformation. So if you go to E to minus B, B to D, obviously these equations are the same. So, and of course, there are more complicated realizations of that, which are more used but right now, but you know, it appears already, of course, there as well. So let's go to the two-dimensional Ising model, which is, of course, one of the oldest examples, one of the oldest mechanics. And here we're just drawing a cartoon, which of course you're all familiar with. So this is a three by three slab of the Ising model. Up or down here is right or left. And this is essentially a partition function with the logical dimensions, two to the n of them, and k is just the coupling constant generated by, by k goals and temperature, and some of the all bonds, the all bonds. And this, of course, is you can solve it in some special cases. And you could conjecture about other cases and so on. But the two-dimensional Ising model is self-dual. And by self-dual, what Thomas and me actually found is you can map a system at high temperature of essentially a small k. So k basically is like one over kt, one over the temperature times the coupling constant j. Connect the system at small values of k to large values of k, and of course, vice versa in a really an exact way, whenever these weak to strong couplings or high temperature, low temperature are connected by this relation. So the product of having a lot of signs is equal to 1. So if 1 is large, every 1 is small. And of course, if k is equal to k star, if you just map back to yourself, it's a little point, then the box sign of 2k is equal to 1, that corresponds exactly to the group of temperature to the measurement. So you can figure it out without doing any for the calculation, if you know that you have this self-duality, of course, you have to know it. But if you know that, you're, you're basically done. You just the box size squared two k's equal to one, which means the critical temperature is equal to one. So it's very, very useful. But of course, you have to find it. You have to, or you obviously have to know it. You're told that it's there. Now, in the quantum arena, the, the way that you have it usually is there's no temperature usually, and you just think about really literally strong to be coupled. So here's an example of that. This kind of simplest example, which again, I guess most of you have not already familiar with, which is a translated IC chain. So in one dimensional chain, you have a spin one half on each side, and you have these interactions. So essentially you have an exchange between nearest neighbors involving the Z, sigma Z, and the transverse field that hence is being transverse along the X direction. And this model is self-dual in the sense that I can, I can exchange H with J. So if I define new variables, if I, if I just find some that mu x is equal to the product that I have here, and I define mu z to be the string product of something like essentially a cube generating operator, then you can realize that the algebra is basically the same, and you can map this to that. So basically, this thing here, the sigma that you have here, you basically going to replace by this. Okay, so basically you change this to that, you change it one field to such a bond. And in terms of involving the fact of sigma z is if you look at this, you look at what happens for two consecutive sigma z is each one is the same changes the string product. But what remains because of spin square is equal to one is just the last part. That's going to give you this thing here. So by doing this simple trick, you can map this to that and you can realize, aha, I can exchange j with h because I just basically just remain Sigma to mu, but otherwise it's the same thing. And therefore, this small is self to an exchange A with H. But you have to realize that you have to do this non local transformation. But in the end, the important thing is that you do this non local transformation, which looks awful, so to speak. Of course, by now we see it many, many, we see it everywhere. But you know, our initial looks quite, in the initial looks quite awful. But the important thing is that at the end you have a local interaction. The form interaction is the same. In this case, you can self do so, you really, so if you think about the coupling constant, like the ratio, let's say, of H to J, then by exchanging J with H, of course, you take that coupling constant from string to, from strong to weak or vice versa. So H over J goes to H, J over H. And that's the general feature of duality, that you go from weak coupling to strong coupling. And this is really the approach that's been used a lot in finding these transformations. Basically, you have to be very clever or we not, or you just you know, do calculations to see some similarity, and then you see, oh, maybe there's a relation here, and then you try to prove it, and then 
if you can find some transformation that actually maps your system to another system, and it really works. They discovered the duality, and that can be quite powerful as an Ising model, and the transfer field Ising model, of course, it's much more complicated systems that have nothing with that to do. But you have to be lucky to find it, so to speak, to prove that it's really there. And the question that sort of inspired us is, is, is there a way to do it without being so smart? Is this a general principle or just, you just found it, basically? So it's like, yeah, no, no. like a sophomore, where you just don't okay, you have to do this, do this, do this, do this, okay. That's the question. So here's another duality, which I think of course you're not familiar with as well. It's basically you've got a Fourier space, the real space, the Fourier space, and there's a P space, and that's where the quantum mechanics, of course, it's rising to one here. So we have this computation relation of X of P. So this is a part of the wave duality, of course. And now we have something just localizing real space. If you actually think about real space, in fact, if you something which is localizing K space, it becomes a plane wave, of course, in real space. So things which are smeared out. One space becomes localized in the other, and vice versa. Of course, that's one of the important things about quantum mechanics. And on the other hand, of course, formally, you can exchange. So but physically, it looks very different. So if we had a delta function in real space, a delta function in metal space, it corresponds to a very, very different state. I mean, completely lo localized, completely localized. But mathematically, if I just want to find a spectrum, and I look at it, the only thing that I have that really defines a problem is this computation kind of relation. <coughs> I can realize, just like in the case of like magnetism, I can map x to minus p, I can map p to x, and it doesn't change one bit this relation. And so if I solve my problem, my problem is invariant in this transformation, then I have this duality and I can find immediately what's going on, and I can constrict this. So for instance, an example of that is, is this. Suppose I have now a general, let's say, one dimensional one body has Newtonian, so you have a magnetic term, potential term, you have this, and basically, of course, this defines a problem, you have to start to solve it. You just find a representation for P and some, some sort of differential equation, and of course, you're done. Or you can do some tricks in some special cases. But if, for instance, if B is very, very special, P is very, very special, which is symmetric under X to P minus X, like for instance, if the potential which you have is quadratic, then this transformation of x to p, p to minus x does not change your algebra, nor does it change from the Hamiltonian. And as a result, your spectrum is invariant under that. Because if you solve this problem, it's of course just this. If you change x to p, you're going to get the same span spectrum, of course. And as it really happens, you're true. But generally speaking, of course, when you have arbitrary potentials p of x here, I'm sorry, here, then you're going to spoil that symmetry that you so you have the algebra, you have the Hamiltonian, and usually this transformation I just wrote down earlier, x to p, p minus x, is not going to satisfy the invariance of the form of h. But of course, if p is quadratic, it, of course it does. I mean, it, it satisfies it, it doesn't break it. So all these examples are really examples of an equivalence, an inter-equivalence. So, so, so one of the major things that I want to get across is even though people usually don't think about it that way, because they, they, you know, they count them with ground state and they say it can't be into your mapping and so on, if you do things right and you count boundary terms correctly and so on, in all the cases I've described to you thus far and many others, the dualities are just a linear transformation. So the spectrum is the same, many of the things are the same, just as a result of that. So you would like to actually find, so I told you, I gave you this, you know, canonical examples, and I guess most of you have only worked before. Classical duality, quantum duality, two dimensional Isaac model, so Isaac chain, and it's a very simple harmonic oscillator. And of course, you'd like to see if there's a relation between the two. You would like to find if there's a way to characterize things in a simple, general way. And I guess more practically, is there a way to actually, without knowing a priori that there's some duality there, and you just have it or you already know what it is, is a way to systematically look for it in general situations. And of course, last but not least, to find, to find actually new duality, not just prove it's already known. <coughs> so this is a Bond algebraic approach. It's a fancy name for a very simple thing. It was inspired originally by Bonds, that's the other name, but it doesn't have to be really Bond. So suppose you have 
an arbitrary Hamiltonian or an action, not the focus of the quantum case, arbitrary Hamiltonian, and it's a sum of some number of terms, usually local terms, which I call here O sub R, plus an arbitrary couple of constants, which I call here J sub R. Now, any of it have what we usually consider an R of this type, and they usually involve you know, Hopkins terms, exchange terms, on-site field terms, paquet terms, whatever you want to think about. And of course, it usually corresponds to some of this form. And now you can think about these bonds as objects in some algebra. And look what happens if you put all possible linear combinations of them and their products and, and so on. In other words, suppose you write down a tenet element, any multiple that you have, the bonds themselves, Things involving either two bonds or three bonds, and anything that you can concoct on the new combinations of these. And so all of these operators span essentially the bond algebra. So the Hamilton is, of course, is a very special case about this new combination that you have of these guys, but it can have many, many other things that reside and involve only bonds that belong to this algebra. So so far, Dewey really doesn't, it's not that useful, I mean, just, just define it. But this thing redefines it completely that what goes on in Hamiltonian. And of course, in the classical case, everything commutes and so on. But again, you can just think about one bond, the product of two bonds, or three bonds, and so on. Or some constraint that usually have as if we go around the isomer, go around the loop, it's equal to one, and so on. So, and all that is encoded in this algebra. So, let's see how that works in the quantum arena, and in the classical arena. Suppose you have two Hamiltonians, H1 and H2. So what I'm showing you essentially is that if you very have essentially the same spectrum, if the bond algebra that they satisfy that they belong, they satisfy are identical. And which and that transformation can be implemented by linear transformation if you write by that long hand. But you, the nice thing about this is you don't actually have to write it down. So it, usually you have to figure out how do I really go from this to that? I have to find some multiple mapping. I have to work hard to figure it out. In this case, by focusing only on the bonds, you don't care about what it looks like. You can just figure out there's a mapping from this Hamilton to this one without actually going through the trouble of actually figuring out what the detailed into the mapping would be. So the multiple operation would have to actually do. So if you can actually map, say, one set of bonds that you had for H1, so suppose H1 is a linear combination of these bonds, and H2 is a linear combination of these bonds. If the algebra that you have, namely all the you know, products and products you're of, and, and linear combinations, concomitants, and so on, that you have for these guys and the same as for these guys, then basically you're guaranteed the spectrum, the spectrum are the same. Okay, so you say that if I have one uh, multiple of which is the product of uh, say several bonds. The first Hamiltonian was just nearest neighbor. The second yeah. Hamiltonian was exactly the same nearest neighbor plus several more terms, oh, no, no, no. but they are based on products of the, of the previous ones. Yes, yeah, so it's one to one mapping. So, 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 so you have that. But the algebras are the same. The algebras are the same, but the one to one mapping. So basically, the Hamiltonian that you have H1, so H1, let's say, co corresponds to a linear transmission. I thought it was. H1, let's say, corresponds to some linear combination. JR1 with OR1. Yeah. And now suppose I can change OR1 to OR2. I just, it's one-to-one -one mapping. I change all the bonds that I have in H1 to a new bond of the bonds in H2. The number of bonds is the same. I don't increase it. Right? The number of bonds is the same. The number of interactions that I have, the number of terms that I have here are the same. I just map one to another. And if the algebra is satisfied that all of these guys, the same as the one that satisfied that all of the ones that one to H2, then we're done. Then the spectra are the same. There are many ways of proving this. I mean, one brute force way of doing it would basically write down wrong hand. There are many ways of doing it. I mean, for instance, if you, if you just want to do it wrong hand, for instance, you can write a partition function, like a six function, rather any fine size system, and you have to calculate the trace that you have at any given order. If you have this, if they are defined as different space size and such like they the same algebra, turn by turn by turn you have the same trace. And the density of states, the plus transform that you have of that would be the same. 
So it's exactly the same thing. So you say if I introduce to the Hamiltonian a term, which is the product, say, of all our all our primes, and you would the same would be a new bond. A new bond and you would the same corresponding new bond H2. So if you simply induce a new bond here, then you have no, to just wait, I'm trying to say this. Well, suppose I add to H yes. a term, yes. which is say number three in the other Yes, this one is exactly this one. You say I will simply create I have to consider it as a new bond. A new bond, and I have to create a new bond in H2. So it's a one to one method. So though algebras will be the same, the Hamiltonians are definitely different with different number of bonds, you don't consider the Another bond is the same. Another bond is the same. But it's a different bond, you say. Yeah, so suppose I have, let's say, just like, suppose you have a chain, it's all your state interactions, and you know, copy whatever you want to think about, and you add one to all three, three sides. Yeah. Now I'm going to map it, and, I, and, the, and suppose in this case I'm going to map it, I can change these guys in H1 to corresponding guys in H2. Then this new term that I have here, I have to look at its corresponding mirror image. So it has a mirror image which corresponds to the mean. You see? So I, basically, I, say, I, I, I change OR1 to OR2, term by term by term. Then we have an appearance that I have an original model of some interaction, and the corresponding dual model will be corresponding interaction. Mm -hmm. I don't have all of a sudden the interaction popping out of nowhere. There's a conservation of it, in most cases, or remember it. So it's really, literally, most cases that you actually find it's a, essentially a mapping of O, O in system one to O in system two. So if the algebra is the same, then you guarantee that basically any combination you have of these guys and, and fractal and fractal and so on, if you make this mapping of O one to O two, then they actually are the same. That's an important point. So let, let, let me just, just write this down just one time. So basically, it's an idea in the, in the simplest case. What if I have, for instance, if I have a I can basically map this. This is H1, this is H2. Now, so basically, I just map O1 to O2. Now I have an additional term which involves you know, R prime, A, A of R naught prime, etc. It involves O of R, O of R prime, and this maps the corresponding image. So you, well, okay. Now my question is that do you exclude dualities when in the second Hamiltonian there is no such thing? It, it, it really doesn't work. So it, it, it's always, in all cases you look at, you have to have this. No, Jeff, what I'm just saying, just imagine, you have a duality, and the first Hamiltonian has two things. The second Hamiltonian has only the first thing. Yeah, usually it's a in just, like, just imagine you have this case. Yeah. The algebra is identical. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the, uh, the first thing will generate the right. It's, it's Though algebras are identical, you say probably this does not qualify for your definition of the other. Right, because you see, the, the Hamiltonian that is so what defined with the system is the Hamiltonian plus the algebra of the other city. So if I have two systems that have the same algebra of these basic things, but they have ones that are different, then they're not different. <laughs> but we, we do have one which are dual. Though they violate all your assumptions. Because you need a longer interaction for example. For example, for example. Yeah. But, that does not but one example is enough just to say, okay, maybe it's not the necessary condition. Well, so even if I arrange the second term in the second row, actually, I can still have a dual model. Actually, to make it, if you want to be, to be exactly right in the same space size, then in most cases, it actually has to be this, this case. This case. It doesn't have to be exactly No, I, I'm not saying case. anything. I just say, well, you restrict yourself to this subspace. Just say, well, maybe it's a zero measure subspace of other dual models, but you are not considering. You are really requiring that the structure of the Hamiltonian is exactly the same. But the algebra, see, it has all the same inner combination of operators, and these operators that sit here are, are the same. There's a one-to-one corresponding between them, basically. Okay. Now, it, so, of course, in some of the algebra, not exactly what very, very well, for instance. 
the cool jazz to X, Y, and so on. So it's a known transformation over other transformations which is this period. It's not exactly known, but it looks extremely well. But if you actually have exact amount for quantum systems, in most cases you have to actually beta score. I haven't seen the one that doesn't have beta score in exact amount. It doesn't say it doesn't exist. Yet. So and essentially the, and the self development is actually even more is even more special. It's essentially for self duality a form of Hamilton is exactly the same. So it has the same interaction with some particular type here, the same interaction with the same particular type of sit here. Namely this these operators are essentially just in the same form. Like the Eisen model, which is the Eisen model, or which has to be the Eisen model, I mentioned earlier. But they're essentially, the mapping that you have exchanging, let's say, one side term with little bonds, the form of the Hamiltonian will not change. It looks exactly the same. Just a couple of values have changed, but the form of H does not change itself. So in all these cases, if you have the same spec, if you have, in general, of course, if you have the same spec, then you have an exact reality, meaning you have the same spectrum, then that means, of course, that there's some Unitary transformations connected to systems. It can be a horribly hard to actually find it, but there has to be one because that's the spectrum. And so that mapping, let's say, in the rising model corresponds to this kin copy that you actually have, which is known local and so on. But it doesn't matter, there is one. But if you have an example of that. So here's an example I mentioned earlier, and this morning, I'll just go through it again very briefly. I just mentioned such a result. Suppose you have this model, so it involves a coupling between, so it's a spin one half model, so two dimensions and school labs, and you have a coupling involving sigma x, sigma x, and dimension over sites along the x direction, sigma y, sigma y, and dimension over sites in the y direction, so called all the compass model. This thing is dual to this system. Dual, not self dual, dual to this system. So here essentially, Exactly a different form. So before it was actually literally a bond that you had between. So here, for instance, in this not this system, it's actually a bond, a little bond, it's just you know, this one, and that one, and so on, connects two sides. And if you, you can actually do the other information and map it onto this system, which looks very different, it involves an on-site field, a transverse field, it involves a ket type term, so involves a product of sigma z's around what each one of these squares and sides not bonds. Looks very, very different, but you can actually find a mapping between one set of bonds that you have here. So for instance, you can map you can map these bonds to plaquette terms, you can map these bonds to on-site terms. It's has the same algebra, and as a result you have same spectrum. And they're dual to each other. And you have to do anything to prove to just look at the algebra basically just look at it. How they commute the two sides, how they anti-commute they actually share one common side, and the square is one, and that's satisfied by, by both of these systems, and as a result, the same number of square size, and as a result, the whole thing is Okay, so and here you don't have to actually worry about what the, what U is. When when you cut that English, what it really is is that you don't have there's a transformation that takes you from H1 to H2. Because obviously these two systems have the same spectrum. But you don't actually have to find what U is. You just, you just realize that you have the same algebra. You can make this transformation of one bond to make first final bond. Which are the same, therefore it's a nature transformation. But I don't really care what this thing is. Of course, I can, I can cap find it, but I don't have to find it. Other examples of that, so it's a Lutheus code model, which essentially it's essentially like a centralized gauge view, centralized gauge view. So it involves the product that you have of sigma x on, on these links. So you have sigma x, so sigma x on these links. And you go around. That's this term, the ket term. And you have a so called star term, which are the type that you have here. And all of these links that impinge on the particular side, that are a common side here. You can find that you have sigma x here and on these. Four sides here. You sum them up on all, star, on all sides and all pockets. You have to find this compared to a code model. This model has a very, very simple algebra. It's actually probably the simplest possible ones. If everything commutes, the square root of thing is one, and there's only one constraint block in the torus. 
basically you go around up to the root you would have constraint. Otherwise, it's everything is trivial. You can map it down to essentially two, two chains that have a same corresponding topology going around the same. And two Isaac chains, and then a sense spectrum, and you get to done. You can also map this on to lever model, which is by Chang Yao Wen. So many of these models I can pose for, for prime memories that you have that immediately. They're very, very simple. So let's consider a few which are slightly more non-trivial, but actually, again, very, very simple. This example of the transferizing model. So here, essentially, the rendition of that thing. So you have it, this term involving sigma z inside i, sigma z inside i plus 1. This I denote like these green bonds. So each green bond here corresponds to the little bond that I have here. And each one of these. What? These dots here, these red dots, correspond to an onset of the field here. So it's just a way of writing down what you have. And now you want to look at algebra. So what you have here, these O's that I have here, so the J's that I have here correspond to either this little J or that little H. And the corresponding operator that I have here correspond to either these bonds here, these green things here, or these red dots. Now look at the algebra that you had. I had all these things. The algebra is very, very simple. Namely, the square of each thing of each one of these bonds, whether it's an on-site term or a little bond, is one, obviously. If I have two disjoint bonds, I can say this one and this one, and this one, this bond here, and this on-site field here, they commute because they don't share a common spin at these roots. And if I have two bonds which are nearest neighbors, like this one. This neighbor here or here, and vice versa, I can focus on this, this one and its two nearest neighbors. They, are, they anticommute because, of course, sigma z anticommute to sigma x at the given site. So basically, the nearest neighbor bonds anticommute. The square of any given bond is 1, and all bonds that don't share a common site commute. And that defines a problem on the number space of size 2 to the n if it has chains 3 to n, and that's it. And you see here that you have a very, very simple transformation that preserves the algebra. Basically, you can just shift. You can basically rename these red dots by these green bonds and vice versa. You can just shift the whole thing and block by one last constant, I mean, one half last constant, and nothing changes. The bond algebra doesn't vary. Again, if this has to to its nearest neighbors, the same thing will also happen here, because you, know, you don't care. You couldn't tell us if you think about these, these green bonds here and the and two corresponding neighbors to left to right, or vice versa, the red dot and two, two corresponding neighbors <coughs> the green bonds to the left and to the right. It's in algebra. So you just rename it. You can just shift the whole thing by like this. But that shift, that shift of shifts corresponds to actually something which is the exchange of J with H. Because remember what H and J are, there's just a prefactors. There are prefactors of, of, of these green bonds and these red dots. So if I exchange the two, I basically exchange J with H. As a, you know, it's proof that you have a duality here, self duality, without actually doing anything fancy. No familiarization, you don't actually have to find the interview mapping of a particular set. It's just a very, very simple thing. So that's what I want to talk about. So there's some, that underlies some of the, there is some transformation, I don't care what it is, which basically exchanges J with H. Can you non local? I don't care. But there is such a transformation. That transformation, of course, happens to be this kinka situation that we just discussed in the beginning. But you know, I couldn't trust that it really is. There is such a transformation. So what it does is basically maps these bonds, these, these green bonds they had a few seconds ago, to those with red dots and vice versa. That was the same, the same spectrum. And that's also a way to actually find out if you if you have self duality or if you have a self duality of one system to another. Basically, you can write down a general Hamiltonian involving the reference to all the order of these two lines, the nearest neighbor, the next nearest neighbor, and so on, with arbitrary coupling constants. You can do the same for a model which would have been self dual. And you can just leave, if there's a particular way to exchange it, the coupling constants to preserve essentially the algebra, if it doesn't work, then you're done. You know there's no transformation that you have to look hard for it. But if it doesn't work, you know there is no transformation. I mean, we don't know what it is, but it works because it, we have a state algebra. And so it also allows you to actually look backwards. So for instance, this realization here, 
that this maps to that, and this maps to that, allows you to actually look backwards to infer, if you wanted to, what the actual detail mapping would have been. But you don't have to do that. And you have to do, you have to come into this finite size system, I won't go through this deep now, but there are some tricky things in finite size systems that you have to do about boundary terms, because you don't, don't do this correctly, but that's where you can get into conclusions in many cases. Now, this transformation does, in most cases, when you do Fourier transform, most cases what you do is, is you have a very simple way of writing down the dual variables. But it could be, nothing prevents you from what this actually happening, it does happen, that your bonds that you actually have do not have to be the simplest thing you think about. It doesn't have to be actually the term that you see in front of you of S dot S or something like that. It can be something more complicated. It could be that your bond is actually, once you think about it to realize that there's a duality, is some in, involved actually the company costume in themselves. And your bond does not need to be always a bare thing itself. Of course, you can think about that as well. But you can be in some cases more clever and actually think about the combinations involving the bare bonds with coupling costs. In other words, the dual variables, the, the, the dual field that you think about, the corresponding properties here and here, actually, are, you can decide what they are. You can actually be just a new type of coupling that you actually have. Or you can decide if you want, basically, you can partition your company in many, many different ways. And each way you partition can give you new insights. It's a good sense to realize the duality that you have in your like, one dimensional spin chain involving transfer theory with x, x and y, y interactions and so on. A simple way of doing that actually looks like the these bonds in this way, if you realize that you know, it's itself it's, it has a duality. So the dual variables can be kind of found, even though you usually don't think about that, and you just do dualities you know, in a simple way. It doesn't have to be the case. Maybe it's not always the case. So the important thing is that actually the bond algebra that we have here is local. Even though in detail u is not local, the resulting Hamiltonians that we have here, to answer your question before, are local. They involve some finite interactions. And essentially, even though the mapping itself that we have it is not local. And so what we basically do, I just emphasize this point for probably too many times, but we use a bond algebra to bypass things normal for just a We can figure them out later, but we have to get that idea in the first place. So here essentially, uh, what I did earlier, so earlier I, 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 I realized that algebra of these two bonds, the same as these two bonds, these the green bonds and the red dots that I had earlier, I could shift. And now if I actually look at the corresponding thing that happened by multiplying these String of the classic series of the sort of product here, I can work backwards and infer what the dual variables are. So the dual variables correspond to the string. But I can do this now working backwards. I have to actually have to do the guess from scratch with this. So I realize it's a mapping, because the bond algebra is the same. I write it down, and then I, I work backwards to infer that the microscopic gives it in the first place. And this, of course, generates kinks, because if you think about something which is Say all polar on x z axis, for instance, and of course sigma x is the upstate of the z axis to the downstate, and vice versa. So it's going to generate a kink that you have starting at size i all the way to the end of the system. So the dual variable that you have here, of course, is a natural dual variable. It gets changed with log excitation. So it's generating log excitation is kink. And we figured out what that is by just looking at bond algebra. Now, how do we actually go to the quantum arena? So, from the quantum arena to the classical arena. So, of course, you can find duality as brute force classic in many different ways, by the series expansions and so on, which is actually one of the older ways, <laughs> very nice ways. But, but if you want to do it in a unified way, you can basically, you're living with just one about the quantum case, and you can get out what we have and so on. And from that, you use whatever corresponding classical duality is, of course, one way to do that is just to write down things in the path integral in relation. Of course, you can tune up people's lives and so on. So you can start from the birth, which is death, and you have all these possible trajectories in your life. And you have to sum over all of them, of course, in this way. And basically, just use this, this trick, this final trick, to find out what the corresponding outline that you have classically to the quantum graph you just described.
So this will actually allow us to live in one, I was saying before, in classical realities, the quantum realities, and actually you can also characterize quantum realities. Because let's say classical realities, how we do that. So that I already showed you that I can exchange J with H. By using the bottom algebra. Now let's see what the compass of that for classical, corresponding classical system. So what you can do is you can write down this in terms of this, let's say, the basis you can pull out of the z-axis classically. In which case now you have to worry about the transmissions between like two different time slices of this guy. And basically if you write down that way, you essentially get this. So now this is now a two plus one, one plus one dimension, space and time, you have one higher dimension now. That's the more popular case. Emergence chain plus, of course, all possibility to move the function of time. And what you have here is the first one plus the action. So this term here now becomes a bond, so to speak, in imaginary time. This thing is a bond that I have along the real axis. And now I have two bonds. Vertically along imaginary time, which is this one. And horizontally, which is the first one. This is the corresponding classic analog of this. But I know this is, of course, trivial. And you can all of you know this. But the important thing is that I, I do know that I can exchange J with H. So what I want to do is to see what that implies a classical system. So you realize that if you exchange J with H, what actually it corresponds to is this relation. So essentially, if you want, if you want these two couplings here to be uniform, so if you want this coupling here and this coupling here to be the same size, and you basically just have to create this thing like that. So you have this relation here. So basically this is equal to that. This is what you have in one way. But, but, but you also exchange, of course, J with H. This is such a lot that we find. So if you exchange J with H, then you have this relation. And essentially, what that implies is, so this position function that you have with coupling constants, K hat. This position function we have a coupling constant K. So this is of Eisenhower, the special Eisenhower, because of course, as you can see here, if I have JM is equal to this and I call this from K, then this was what the function I have to measure Eisenhower with coupling constant K, uniform one with coupling constant K. So on the one hand, it of course the position function I have so here with coupling constant K, that K is equal to JM, which is equal to must have to be on the other hand with H. On the other hand, if I do this other way, exchange it with H, then you'll get this K hat here, and you'll get the same relation, you know, J and H is a change. And what that implies, basically, you can now relate K hat to K, because I know this relation between J and H in both instances. And what that implies is they have this relation. The Pragan blocks signs of the two one. So basically it's another way of getting classical reality as a consequence of quantum reality, which is trivial. Basically a consequence of just realizing that the red dots and the blue bonds can be interchanged because they have some So this is the concept of reality and this is a way of arriving at it, of course. So just a way of getting classical realities from, from what you have on the camera. And of course you can do this more complicated system. But that's the general idea. Okay, so you go from the one dimensional quantum system to the one higher dimensional classical system, you realize that some duality here, and you find the corresponding duality here. Now, there's a relation between dualities and symmetries. And people many times say that duality squares equal to one, which is often true, but actually not always necessarily true. So if you have two systems, that have the same spectrum, you can, of course, as you, just, as you know, and I just reiterate the case of relativity, that means there's some lingering entering map that relates to. Now, if you have that H1, that sits here, and H10, which I'm going to do, sits here, are the same form, I just a very copy and so on, then in that case, basically, it's a very, very special entering map. In fact, if I'm going to do this thing twice, if I Look at U D U squared H dagger squared. I'm going to basically exchange it with H and do it again one more time. So they get back the same amount of time. So in other words, I'm going to the same spectrum. If I look at U 
you would log it twice, which means that the squared is a symmetry. In other words, if I have a sub-duality, the sub-duality implies a non-trivial symmetry. There's some symmetry which is equal to this duality, this property which is an implicit duality squared. So u squared is equal to symmetry of symmetry. So a self-duality in the computer sort of way, it's not really exact, is a square root of a quantum assumption. So u squared is equal to 1, and the implicit duality is u, and that u is square of that symmetry operation. On the other hand, if I have a self-dual point, so it maps back to itself, the self-dual point, if I exchange a with h, I get the same thing. So h is equal to j, so I exchange a with h, I get the same thing. So the self-dual point uses a symmetry, so it, emerges, so it appears as symmetry at only one point, everywhere else it appears as a, it's a square root of symmetry. And of course it can be a general symmetry, it can be one, but it doesn't have to be, it can be more complicated. So, so far I told you about duality that I've known forever, basically. Now I'm going to tell you about most of them. Realities are actually not so new, they're actually new. So, of course, one of the things you like to understand is what happens in because one dimensions, a free space plus one time dimension, the last gauge for so you see it's like a so-called confinement and so on, which involves non-dual fields. <coughs> and actually talked a long time ago about the idea that you start making more complicated last gauge trees involving SUN, which is SU3, of course. You should look at what happens to Zn, essentially the group, which is the center of SUN. The group essentially involves the n foot identities. And so essentially, last gauge for a group of involving Zn fields. So here's a cartoon of that. Basically, you go, you sum over all possible plaquettes of your system, so you have a Hubbard class in group of dimensions. You go around any closed plaquette, basically measure the square. You look at the trace or the part that you have of the links, pi to j, j to k, and so on. These are, in general, of course, these are elements that you would have to around you in. But now you make life simple, and you just think about the viewing group, you just think about the group which is composed of the n of the entity, this number is real part, 2 pi is the entity divided by n. And the real part of uh, some copying constant, n minus c. So, what, what the phases that you have is this one. So, it turns out actually that this model is self dual, so the new result. So, it, so it was known to be self dual for all n plus n to 4. It was connected to be non self dual for larger than 4. It turns out to be self dual for all values of n. And the way that we actually find it is by going backwards to find a corresponding quantum Hamiltonian whose action is the one that should be. Realizing again, you have a very simple transformation that preserves your algebra. And you can figure out exactly what the self dual point is. The one that went down for you, but you can do that. And that value is used exactly for my. So you can see the quantum numerical results of that gauge first actually could be exactly what you expect to get. In this case. So, so essentially, so, so essentially uh, if you have this, so these are essentially just features that, that, uh, that you, that are a consequence of, of things that you're doing. It, it, actually, I have, so, uh, I'm sorry, but, uh, so uh, one thing is actually, it turns out actually, furthermore, if you look at some of the that you get in the case I just told you about a few moments ago, it, the, the duality equation itself, the sub duality equation itself, the equation is satisfied itself through a company, identical to what you get for essentially a clock model that you should look at, in which essentially, what you look at it for a clock model essentially it's like an XY model that the angles are quantized. You can do either this, this, and so on. So you have say two the clock, two set clock, clock model, and that means essentially you have two, two possible orientations that you have for a vector and you can do like this. And essentially the equation that you get is exactly the same that you would have for a clock model. So this is a clock model two dimensions, classical one two dimensions, this is a glass gauge for your one dimension, but the equation that you actually get is exactly the same. And you don't have and, and you can get this Exactly, also the dimensional vector class one the clock model, and there's no need to do any trade, no need to do the vector summations, it's exact. Okay. 
So you can actually, so this is a summary, we can actually look systematically for dualities by looking at the bond algebra that we have. The algebra can be always right, so it can be a You can actually, using this, you can actually look at the cross classical dualities. You can work backwards to find cross band dual variables. You can find new sub dualities and new dualities. You can find so, so new sub dual points. I have not mentioned this earlier, but actually, no more I mentioned afterwards. But actually, dualities do not have to be exactly everywhere. You can also emerge at the lower intersection places. So here we have two systems that are not dual to one another. But if you go to energy to another sector, then you are some they are dual to one another. So emerge the duality can emerge in some cases at particular limits. It doesn't have to be it's always there or always not there. And actually this appears for some other problem here some other cases. So the sub-dualities are scores of symmetries. And only at a sub-dual point it becomes a symmetry. So it's a way of also finding if you have a Except for the just the in the system. It also allows you to find such as many problem high dimensions, and you get a chance to go for that. But you can solve if you have Heinegger model, for instance, with basically a few lines without being the usual tricks in line of commands. I mean, it can be a to it and so on. Uh, you can find that there's the reality and so on. You can actually do other ones I've not talked about. You know, there's this model, the model is good one, and so on. And of course, there are big questions. So I have not talked about the random results yet, about non dual realities. I did mention essentially the loss of relation to Fourier transforms. Uh, but of course, you would like to see if that's to be the entire thing. And can you use this in a general way? I just showed you it works. I didn't show you how you can do it in a general way because I don't know. But can you use it in a general way to actually find the classified quantizations? I have a question. You know, most countries to already say that two D or one plus one are used for exactly solvable or integrable models. And uh, can you say something about it? Or if the model is not integrable, is this the only thing that can be useful and used for something? Same question. Same question. So I, I don't see why. So I mean, I, 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 so in general, it doesn't mean that. I mean, you can know, it does. In the case of the tradition, actually, what happens, you know, simply start with the So this is the position, um, there's no function, and it's not good for value. But it doesn't tell you about the It's not good for the job. In most cases, it corresponds to the same thing. So most systems are absolutely. Do you know any examples of self dual models uh, where you don't have an exact solution? Yeah. I have, but it's too big. I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, I don't have but 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 you just look at the consequence if you have some sort of duality, but then you try to find out sort of duality. And what they imply is basically that things involving position functions you have in some company to itself. So it doesn't say anything about sort of duality. That by itself is not enough to question what it is in some company. Yeah, if I have one way of cross field, then it's some little point. So the line. So Yeah, it's actually a short range of the 